message today, as we go into your word and we look at the things that you want for us to take in today, God, that we have eyes to see, that we have ears to hear, that we have hearts that we comprehend what you have for us, and that we would leave new, Lord God, that things would change in us, God, that we would, this would be a catalyst for us to continue to walk hard after you, to follow hard after you, to grow after you, I pray. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, thanks for having me here today. Um, as Pastor Andrew said, yeah, my name is Hillary. My husband, Jared, and I are pastors in Watertown, Wisconsin. We co-pastor River City Church in Watertown, so if you're ever our way, feel free to stop in. And uh, we have four tiny humans between the two of us. Only two of them are here today. The other two are at church with my husband. Uh, in the morning, he leads worship and he preaches most Sundays, and so having two extra little ones to try to keep track of while you're trying to lead worship just does not work. So if I travel and speak, which I do on occasion, I take them with me. So I have my own little entourage that comes along, whether they like it or not. Um, and so we have a good time. Um, yeah, as Andrew said, that we, we served as missionaries. We were missionaries in the country of Tunisia for two and a half years, which is in North Africa, between Libya and Algeria. Prior to that, I was a youth and children's pastor in Minnesota. And after we came home from the mission field, believing that we were going to go back, we'd come home to fundraise and do those things again. God redirected us through a series of events, just made it very clear that we weren't to go back to the field, but that he was calling us to Watertown, Wisconsin. Which, let me tell you, after, after being overseas and then being transitioned to a community like that, it was a shock to the system. And it was a change, and it wasn't a change that we expected, but we have been there for eight years now, and we know that's exactly where God wanted us to be. And we prayed for years, you know, God, take us to where you want us to go, take us to the people that nobody else wants to go to. And that sometimes means you end up in small town USA, right? So well, I grew up in Wisconsin. I grew up in Wausau, which is a few hours north of here. So I'm a Wisconsin girl. My husband's from Indiana, and he's learned to live here. And uh, he loves it. And I just, I just gave him a hard time. I just said, you know, he loves Wisconsin. He loves being here. And um, we, we love what God is doing in Watertown. So this morning, we're going to go right back into the series that you have been doing, Live Like a King, taking a look at the Beatitudes. And if I were to give this week a subtitle, it would be, what are you hungry for? What are you hungry for? And it's interesting because as I was preparing for this message, that was the message, that was what God kept speaking to me. He kept saying, what are you hungry for? And you know, we talk about living like kings, living like Jesus, following after the ways of Jesus, not after the pattern of earthly kings, but after the example that Christ gave us. And when we look at this passage in Matthew, we see a very clear picture that Christ's idea, God's idea for how he wants us to live was not surface form of religion and going through the motions, but taking these things deeper in us. And being a king and following like Christ and living like a king is beyond just putting a crown on someone's head. You can put a crown on someone's head. I saw a picture yesterday that this photographer put a crown on a pig's head, and it was adorable. But that pig's not a king. Right? It's what's in here that makes someone kingly. And in Matthew chapter 5, looking at verse 6 today, it says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Some translations say filled. <coughs> and the thing of it is, is we look at this, and if you think about hungering and thirsting, you think about the way that kings eat and drink. We imagine lavish banquets and delicacies. I think 2017, The Independent did a story on Queen Elizabeth on what she eats every day. Because people care, right? What she eats every day. The things that they eat, the things they consume. I mean, look at history. We can see that beyond just the physical hungers, but like what God is talking about here, what's in here, the things that we are hungry for inside, the things we are thirsty for inside, the things that motivate us, the things that derive us, the things that lead us. If we look at history, those things in kings have changed the world. Am I right? The things that they were passionate about, whether it be pharaohs building monuments to themselves in Egypt, whether it be Babylon conquering nations and building this mass kingdom, whether it be King Henry VIII, who obsessively tried to have a male heir. And we have all this history that was changed because their they followed their passions. They follow the things that drove them. And humanity has been chasing after earthly cravings for as long as we've been human. 
The Bible gives us lots of examples of what some of those earthly cravings are in 1 Timothy chapter 6. I apologize. When the, the, the trees get beautiful, I get a cough every year. So I apologize. If I'm coughing this morning, it's because nature is beautiful, but it hates me. Okay. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. So that those who desire to be rich will fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith that pierced themselves with many pangs. So the idea that money, wealth, things, it's a craving within humanity. 1 John chapter 2, 16 says, For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not from the Father, but of the world. The worldly desires for physical pleasure. The desire for things that we behold. The desire for the pride of life to be able to boast, to have power, to have authority, to be someone important. Those desires are well within humanity. And then Proverbs chapter 21 gives us another example. In verse 17, it talks about whoever loves pleasure will be a poor man. He who loves wine and oil will not be rich. The idea of going after earthly pleasures, after entertainments. People are driven and consumed by entertainment. Now, I'm a bit of a geek. I will line up for a Star Wars movie, just to be honest. I will. Lord of the Rings, all that I am there. Okay? So I get that desire. But when we become consumed, and our cravings for these things take over to the point where they become idolatry, that's where we have a problem. And none of these struggles, none of these are new. When we look at the scriptures, we look at the things that people have dealt with, and God gives us such awesome examples of the children of Israel of these things. And in the Old Testament, we see a clear example. We're going to look at the book of Daniel today. If you'll turn with me in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 1. Am I going too fast? Are you still with me? Raise your hand if I'm too fast. Am I too fast? Okay, I will slow down. I'm sorry. When I get excited... And the Bible gets me excited. I tend to talk quickly. My church people are used to it. I do have signalers in there that will wake up and be like, hey, that's really where you slow down. Um, but I'll slow down. We're going to go to the book of Daniel. Now, to give you some backstory in the book of Daniel, the children of Israel had just gone through one of the worst things in the history of Israel. Back in Deuteronomy chapter 28, they had made a deal with God. They had made a covenant with God that if they would do what God asked them to, they would honor God, they would obey God, but that they would be blessed in every way. And you could read through this, that there was blessings and inheritance and legacy and future and purpose that God was going to give them if they stayed true to God. But if they turned their back on God, the opposite was going to happen. The scriptures tells us that, that if they did these things, in Deuteronomy 20, that they would be the awe of nations. But if they turn their back on God, that they would be an object of horror, is what the scriptures tells us. And this is something they willingly chose to go into after God delivered them from Egypt, that they chose to, to follow God because they knew God was true. They knew God had the best thing for them. And God did. He blessed them. And he built them up and he made them an amazing nation. And God did marvelous works among them, and his presence was with them. And they encounter God in real and tangible ways. But what often happens is when things are good, we start walking away from God and we turn to earthly desires. So those blessings became their idol. So the money and the wealth and the things that they admired in other nations right down to their very gods became the things they wanted. So they still had their temple and they still were going through the form of doing what God wanted them to do in worship and interaction with God. But they also had their shrines to Baal. And they had the other things that they were investing in. And it got so bad that in Jeremiah chapter 2, and I'm just giving you the Cliff Notes version. I encourage you to read this, but on a sunny day because it's kind of heavy. God says, you know, he accuses them and says, you committed idolatry, you turned your back on me. And because of this, I'm going to keep my promise to you to set judgment, which was the side of it, that if they turn their back on the covenant, that God was going to make them an object of horror. And so God sent Babylon and did that very thing. If you read through Jeremiah and into the book of Lamentations, the description of the absolute destruction 
the absolute destruction where most people died or were enslaved is unbelievable. And that is what leads us up to Daniel chapter 1. That's what Daniel just lived through. That's what just happened. To see the people of God reduced to a small number compared to what they were. To see the temple ransacked, the objects taken. I mean, horrible, horrible things taking place because they had turned and followed their cravings, not for righteousness, not for the things of God, but for the things of this world and had turned their back on God. So, in Daniel chapter 1, beginning with verse 1, it says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into the hand with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. And then the king commanded Ashpenaz, the chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of a royal family and of nobility, youths without blemish, of good appearance, skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge and understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's place and to teach them the literature and the language of the Chaldeans. The king assigned them daily portion of food that the king ate and the wine that he drank. They were to be educated for three years, and at the end of that time, they were to stand before the king. Among these were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, the tribe of Judah. And the chief of the eunuchs gave them names. Daniel he called Belteshazzar. Hananiah he called Shadrach. Mishael he called Meshach. And Azariah he called Abednego. So we have the people of God literally carried away as slaves or destroyed by their appetites. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in your sexual immorality, impurity, passions, evil, desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. On the account these the wrath of God is coming. So even to us, we are given the same cautionary tale that we see in the people of God, that if we pursue these things, the wrath of God will come upon us. And does that mean that God doesn't love us? No, it just means God's not going to spare us from our stupidity. If we pursue things outside of God, there are consequences to those things. And living like kings means not being ruled by earthly desires, but like Christ, that we are to put to death those desires, so that the desire for the righteousness of God, the desire for the things of God, is the first and foremost motivator in our lives. And that the things that we pursue outside can and will cause us to be destroyed. We see this with people pursuing all manner of things that are not of God. It leads to their own destruction. Or we will become enslaved by them and consumed by them. And we see this too in our culture, don't we? That we become enslaved in some capacity by our need for money or our need for things or our need for approval or our need for pleasure in some capacity. That people become addicted and enslaved by these things. And God doesn't desire us to live that way. That we were to follow after living like kings to be blessed. The way that kings are blessed. The way that Christ has called us to be blessed. We are to die to those things and let Christ live in us so that we can pursue better. Let's go back to Daniel. Going down to verse 8. But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or the wine that he drank. Therefore he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. And God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs and the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear, my lord, the king who assigned your food and drink. For why should he see you were in worse condition than the youths who are of your own age? So you would endanger my head with the king. Then Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs had assigned over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Test your servants for ten days. 
Let us be given vegetables to eat, water to drink. Then let our parents and the appearance of the youths who eat the king's food be observed to you, and deal with your servants according to what you see. So we listened to them in this matter and tested them for ten days. So Daniel and company when placed in Babylon, which was the picture of decadence, which was the picture of everything outside of what God wanted. And when they were presented with this opportunity to literally be fed off the king's table, the king of Babylon, they do not accept it. And they ask to not have to. Because if they've learned anything from what has just happened, is that pursuing these things and embracing these things does not lead to health and blessing and righteousness but to destruction. So their first act as slaves in this kingdom after feeling God's judgment is to say, no, we're going to live right. We're going to live true. We're going to do what God wants us to do. 1 Corinthians gives us this awesome passage that I love. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. <coughs> says, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, you will provide a way of escape that you may be able to endure it. That verse gets used a lot to say that God doesn't give us more than we can handle, but that's not what it says. It says, in temptation, that God will give us a way out. And the thing about these temptations, it puts pressure on those things in us that we already have, right? It puts pressure on our anger, right? It's okay to be angry. The Bible says you can get angry. It says your anger do not what? Sin, right? Okay? <coughs> Sorry. So, like for me, I've struggled with anger most of my life because it was like the okay emotion. Did you grow up in a family where anger was the okay emotion? Like you could get angry. <laughs> and so that's a button that gets pushed a lot for me. I have four button pushers in my house that like to push my anger button. And you know what? There are days that I see that way out of temptation, and there are days that I just see red. But God gives us those opportunities to step out in whatever our temptations may be. And for these young men, they were faced with insurmountable temptations. They could do what they wanted. This was a new world and a new life. They could have said, well, God didn't work for us. Our friends are dead. City's gone. We're in the king's palace. We can just do whatever we want, right? But they chose not. They chose to honor God. Because the thing that you learn through the story of God destroying the people of God this way, is that God keeps his promises. Right? He kept his word. Even if his word is hard, he kept his word. And Jesus himself, we know from Matthew 4, just before the Beatitudes in Matthew 4, he was telling oh, thank you so much. Yeah, I'm sorry, these horrible allergies. <coughs> Jesus was tempted. And he was able to resist those temptations, not because he was just God, because the scripture tells us he was fully God and fully man, but because he stood on the word of God. And the thing is, without regular time with God, without regular time in God's word, without going below the surface, without going beyond just the form of faith, we will not be able to resist temptation, because we won't see God's way out, because we won't hear him the way he wants us to hear him. Living like a king means training ourselves for the challenges we will face. And following Christ, that there will be challenges and that being able to resist temptation. Psalm 37, in verses 16 and 17, says, Better is a little that the righteous has than the abundance of many wicked. For the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholds the righteous. And in this situation, you can look at Daniel and these guys, and they're eating vegetables and water. And it doesn't seem like much. And most of us would be like, you know, where's the bacon? You know, where's, where's the things that we want with it? But the thing of it is, is that meager portion, which I'm sure looked ridiculous to the others who were eating off the king's table. Like, why wouldn't you eat the king's food? He has the best food. Why wouldn't you drink the king's wine? He has the best wine. And they're resisting it. And it looked like nothing. And often, righteous living looks meager on the outside. Because we learn to be content. The blessings of God are contentment. 
The blessings of God are being able in any circumstance, like Paul says, to give praise and honor and to be content, whether sick or well, whether in poverty or in blessing, whether we have a place to sleep or we don't. We know at the end of the day, when we pursue righteousness, as Christ calls us to, if everything is stripped away, if you have nothing left, you have Christ to sustain you. And that is wealth. And so it looks meager. But the wealth and the riches and the blessing were beneath the surface that others could not see, but God could see and they knew. And you see this as you go through the book of Daniel, you read about this man and these other men were with him. And the things that they are challenged, you see God's favor and God's hand on their lives. You see people of prayer who are pursuing the things of God in the midst of horrible situations, in the midst of unsurmountable temptation. They stay true to the course of God because they pursued and were hungry and thirsty for righteousness above all. And if we place our worth rather in how we meet the cultural standards of our society, rather than God, we will fail. We will be destroyed. And it's so easy to do. We live in a culture where one click you can go online and you can see people living in ways that you can't imagine living. Am I right? Yeah. And it's easy in our hearts to be like, well, I'm an American too. I can do it, right? That's our dream, right? That anybody can rise from the bottom to the top. But in God's kingdom, in Christ's kingship, and living a king like Christ, we pursue the things of God, whether it takes us to the top or whether we stay at the bottom. Because at the end of the day, we know wherever we are, if we are in God's place for us, we are blessed. Okay? We are blessed. And I'm not just saying this from someone who hasn't experienced difficulty. There were years of our lives where we literally had $25 a week for groceries with children. But God provided. We never went without. We never went without. Because God's provision and his care and his blessing are in those places that we pursue his purposes and his righteousness. Let's go back to Daniel again. Daniel chapter 1, going down again from where we left off. So verse 15, at the end of 10 days, it was seen that they were better in appearance and fatter in flesh than all the youths who ate the king's food. So the steward took away their food and wine that they were to drink and gave them vegetables. So at the end of the test, they looked better than the guys who been eating meat and drinking wine. They were better in appearance. And that's what righteousness does in our lives. It transforms us. Physically transforms us. I love seeing testimonies of people that turn to follow Christ and you see their countenance changes. Because what's happening in here and in here changes. The desires that are here lead us to things that increase our wealth and our health overall as a person. And I'm not talking financial wealth necessarily. I'm talking about the wealth of knowledge that we have the wealth of relationship we have with God, the wealth of understanding of what it means to get along with other people. We learn to love people better. We learn to care for people. We learn to do things better. Matthew chapter 6. In verse 33, it's a familiar passage. It tells us that we should seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you that our internal desires, the things that we think we want, God asks us to lay them down. He asks us to give it. And when we talk about dying to self, we talk about these things, when we talk about living like a king like Christ, <coughs> this transformation process that has to happen for us to be more like Jesus means laying all of these other things down. Laying down whatever it is that motivates us and saying, God, if these things are not in line with the desires that you have for my life, if these passions, if these hungers, if these thirsts, if these drives within me are idols, help me to give them to you. Because Matthew chapter 5, our passage for today, verse 6 says, Blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled that as we pursue this quest, that as we commit our ways to God, as we surrender these things to the Lord, that it's not some sort of ascetic quest where we deny ourselves 
and we give up things, and we live some sort of weird life that will lead to nothing. But the scripture says that when we fill, we will receive the things of God. That as we pursue God, God will make himself known to us more. As we pursue righteousness, God will change us. Our things that we want are different. The things that I wanted before I came to Christ and the things that I want now as a believer are night and day different. I never wanted children. Never wanted children. From the time I was little, all the little girls were like, I want kids. And I'm like, nope. I don't want kids. Why would I want kids? Even when I got married, my husband went to talk to my parents before he asked me to marry him. And my mom said, no, you understand she doesn't want kids, right? Are you okay with this? Because she didn't want someone marrying me and then be disappointed. Because he's like, I understand. But God knew we needed these children. And so, you know, my husband had always been praying, like, you know, that we are to have kids, that God would change my heart. Because I was a holdout. I was like, I'm not having children. We are going in the mission field. We are going to care for spiritual children. We don't have time for real children. Okay? And one night I had a dream. And in that dream, the Lord showed me my kids that I was going to have. Literally showed me the kids that I was going to have. And I woke up sobbing because I missed them. And I knew at that moment that God was changing my heart for this. And I began praying, and the Lord made it very good. No, you're going to have kids, and you're going to have these four kids. And I was like, this is insane, but we're going to have kids. Because God had a purpose probably to change me most of all because, good Lord, Having children, if you have children, changes you. You realize you have to be a better person all the time, not just some of the time. And God has a plan for these little ones' lives. They can impact things that I can't. They're equipped in ways that I'm not. And God wants to do things. And so that's a huge change for me. That I never wanted to have kids. I never wanted to be in church. I never wanted to have anything to do with God. I was raised in church. I didn't want anything to do with any of this. And God transformed me and changed my life. And here I am as a pastor. Where you're in church all the time. <laughs> God is so funny. So, God changes us. He changes our desires. And we are filled as a result of pursuing the righteous things of God. My life is full. I'm filled and I'm blessed because of God in my life. And for many of us, this begins with a spiritual detox. A detox of our lives. The things in our life that are getting in the way of what God wants for us. We have to let God detox us. Now, I had an issue this last year, just recently, with my stomach where I started having stomach pains. I don't know why. Everything I ate hurt. And it got so bad that I finally ended up going to the doctor and they did all the scans. They're like, well, we think it's your gallbladder. Well, it's not your gallbladder. We think it's this. It's not that. They could find nothing wrong with me. But I knew I was hurting. So they gave me some prescription, like, keep an eye on it. And it kept hurting. And it got to where I could only eat certain foods. So the things that I liked, like jelly beans and, and horrible gummies, I couldn't eat those. The LaCroix that I loved to drink, I couldn't drink that. Um, I couldn't eat red meat. So there was a whole list of stuff that I couldn't eat. And I was reduced to eating super healthy. And my body went through like a detox process to where I was drinking regular water a lot more and doing all these things more. And then as my stomach started to heal, which it is now, my appetite changed. I wasn't wanting all those things anymore because I'd lost a taste for them. That this process had changed my desires for what I thought was important and what I needed. And that's what God does. He doesn't give us stomach aches, but sin does, right? And desiring things outside of God leads us down paths that are not what God wants. And God wants to do a detox in our lives. He wants to change our appetites and our desires. For the things of him. If you'll turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm 63 if you have them. I want to close today with this psalm. <coughs> Living like a king. Like Christ. Having the blessings of God in our lives. Having the righteousness of God in our lives. Starts with a deep longing for God. And a deep desire for Christ. And Psalm 63 paints a picture of a king longing for God. And I love it. And I love David. David's one of my favorites in the scriptures. And this is a psalm of David. And he wrote it when he was in the wilderness. Which is a fancy word for basically desert. And even in those dry and barren places, this person who became one of the greatest kings in the history of, of Israel, 
who's known as a man after God's own heart, profound longing took place in his life, and he's marked by that longing. And if we are to pursue Christ, we need to ask God to give us that hunger and that longing, that desire to detox us and purchase. And I just want to read this to you today. <clears throat> oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you. As in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food. And my mouth will praise you with joyful lips. When I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night, for you have been my help. In the shadow of your wings I will sing for joy. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. But those who seek to destroy my life shall go down to the depths of the earth. They shall be given over the power of the sword. They shall be a portion for jackals, but the king shall rejoice in God. All who swear by him shall exalt, for the mouths of liars will be stopped. We have such a beautiful picture of that longing that God wants us to have for him. And it's easy to get away from it. I remember times in my life where I would just lay at the altar for hours after service just pursuing God and other times in my life where I felt like, oh yeah, God, I need to pray today. Right? <clears throat> and God wants us to have that consistent, faithful, obedient desire for him. The thing that I'm learning more and more is that diligence, that steadfastness is what makes us. And we live in a culture of extremes where we're either all in or we're kind of in. Or not at all. Right? But God wants us to find that steady place with Him. And there will be times when it's here and we're on the mountaintop with God. There will be times where it feels like we're in the desert. But that steady line of pursuit of walking after Him, hard after Him and pursuing Him is what God wants us to be today. If the worship team could come up, we're going to go ahead and take a time of reflection. <coughs> The question I began with today, the question that God has been speaking to my spirit as I've been preparing for this message in the last few weeks, is the one I want to close with today. And that's, what are you hungry for? What are you truly hungry for? What is driving you? Is it a pursuit of righteousness and the things of God, or is it something else on your to-do list? Because today the thing that's clear is that if we are to live like kings and we are to be filled and receive the blessings of God, we must be hungry for him first and foremost. We must be thirsty for the spirit and the presence of God. So let's take some time. If you want to come up here and pray, you can. You stay in your seat and pray. We're just going to take a few minutes just to let the Lord speak to us about that today.